You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. For moms, with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Reproductive psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to. Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so they may experience physical and emotional well being and find joy in motherhood. Please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I am also mom to three kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. So throughout the show, I'm going to remind you that you are more than welcome to give us a call, 866-451-1451. And we are continuing our Mama Docs on-call series, where I introduce you to physicians who are also moms, and they're here to provide information and support geared to you and your family. And today, we are welcoming my colleague and friend, New York City-based gastroenterologist, Dr. Jennifer Bonar. And we are going to talk about all things GI, um, which, frankly, I think there's a huge amount, and hopefully we'll get to it, because gut health is something that, you know, is really important, and I feel like a lot of people, you know, we manifest lots of things by way of our, our gut, right? Like, if you're nervous, you have stomachs like there's so much but when do we know that it's medically a concern versus something that is not we're gonna learn welcome hi thanks for having me so let's just start like for those who are listening who may not fully understand what is a gastroenterologist um so i am a physician who focuses on illnesses that are related to the intestinal tract, but also the gallbladder, the liver, the bile duct, the pancreas, anything related to digestion. And who is your typical patient? So my typical patient can really be anyone. Uh, I I take care of adults, so my typical patient will be over 18 years old. very often, my uh, I will see healthy people with uh, with no concerns whatsoever uh, at 45 years or older who simply need screening colonoscopies to screen for colon cancer and colon polyps. Um, but I can see adults really of any age who have conditions that I treat. So the conditions that I treat uh, range from acid reflux, peptic ulcer disease celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, any kinds of esophageal disorders, so difficulty swallowing, um, constipation, uh, the long list. Yeah. But, uh, that's, yeah. That's a <laughs> so lot. Keep going. I'm just... It's a lot. So it keeps it interesting, though, that's for sure. I'm sure it's like never one day is never the same as the next. Um, so you said 45 and over screening colonoscopy, but what? Let's say someone's like, you know, super healthy eater, never gets sick. You know, do they really need to observe that time frame? Like, could they wait a little longer, or is no. it 
unrelated to they should come who you are um no I, so the the whole point of uh of doing colonoscopies is to keep the healthy people healthy um so we don't you know i i always prefer when a patient comes in for a colonoscopy without any worrisome symptoms, um, without the symptoms that would make them say, oh, wait a minute, I think I need to call somebody. I'm having rectal bleeding or I've noticed a change in my bowel habits or I'm having abdominal pain or, or something that, you know, something that might suddenly raise a red flag or an antenna and make them concerned. People should be considering colon cancer screening at 45 for no other reason than just simply uh, colon cancer is the third most common cause of cancer that we see in the general population. So I think that's a really good reason. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's funny, people ask me, well, women actually will often say, well, I, I don't need to have a colonoscopy as, as often as my husband or at all, because isn't that a condition that is more in men than in women? And it's just entirely not the case. It's, it's, it's for the most part equal between men and women. We see colon cancer, um, I think they're they're estimating this year that we'll probably see another 150,000 new cases in the United States of colon cancer. Um, and the good news is that we do colonoscopies not only to screen for colon cancer, um, uh, which we've been able, you know, we started doing colonoscopies probably somewhere in the mid 80s, and we've seen this precipitous uh, drop. Remarkably enough, given how how uh, how prevalent the cancer still is, um, but in the prevalence of colon cancer because we're now screening for it. Um, but not only not only screening, we're preventing colon cancer by doing colonoscopy. So when we do a colonoscopy, yes, I'm screening for colon cancer, but I'm doing it just as importantly to prevent colon cancer because I'm looking for non-cancerous polyps, little growths of skin. Uh, that can be anywhere throughout the colon. And if I see those, I remove them. They're completely imperceptible. A patient will never know that they have a polyp. Almost invariably, it's impossible for them to detect that symptomatically. And I remove them uh, right then and there during a colonoscopy. And sometimes those polyps have precancerous potential. Often they do. And so by virtue of removing a polyp, I'm actually preventing colon cancer as much as I'm screening for it during the, during the colonoscopy. So. We really should be doing colonoscopies when we feel fine. Of course we do them when we don't. But when you feel fine, even if you're the healthiest eater and you have no medical history and no family history, um, you've seen an increase, particularly a younger population of people with colon cancer, which is why the uh, screening guidelines dropped to 45 from 50 a few years ago. Now, how does family history modify recommendations? So... The average recommendation is that everyone should start at 45. Um, if you have a family history of colon cancer, and generally we, we consider family history um, when, we're, when we're considering screening for, for other family members, we look at first degree family members, so parents, siblings, children. If there's a family history of colon cancer in um, a first degree relative, um, we either will start at 45 or at 10 years younger than the youngest affected relative. So if there's a family member who had colon cancer at 50, that was diagnosed at 50, then actually their first degree relatives should start screening at 40. So it's whatever comes first, either 10 years younger than the youngest uh, affected relative or at 45. Okay. Now, Cologuard has very cute commercials with a little, I don't even know what that little guy is meant to be. He's the box. I guess he's a Cologuard box, maybe. Um, is that a, um, is that equivalent to having a full colonoscopy? So Cologuard is a good test. Um, I, I think there's some value in Cologuard. It is not a replacement for a colonoscopy. I often well, I actually haven't seen that, that, that commercial, but I, many people have, and patients will come in and say, well, I, you know, I don't actually want to have a colonoscopy. I'm going to have a Cologuard instead. Um, so what a Cologuard is, is it's a stool test, and it, it, the test looks at the stool to detect either blood, well, blood and um, DNA markers that are meant to predict the presence of either colorectal cancer or advanced colon polyps. 
So, and it's it's pretty good. Um, if it comes back positive, it, it certainly then necessitates a, a proper colonoscopy, um, and because uh, you don't really know what you're seeing, you just get a positive test. But the problem with a colobard, the problem with a colobard for somebody who can otherwise have a colonoscopy, meaning somebody who doesn't have uh, risk factors, who, who doesn't, who isn't on blood thinners or has cardiac risk factors or, or medical reasons why a colonoscopy, the risk of a colonoscopy, which is extremely small, um, but nonetheless, why they, the risk of a colonoscopy or just undergoing a procedure uh, wouldn't be possible. Then a colobard is great. It's better than nothing. But in a person who can have a colonoscopy, an otherwise healthy person with no significant comorbidities, then um, it doesn't allow me to really prevent colon cancer the way that I can with a colonoscopy because the colobard is designed to pick up either cancer which is fine, or advanced colon polyps. So larger polyps, more polyps that have moved along the progression towards colon cancer, um, but not the small, not the tiny little five millimeter polyps that I can see very clearly on a colonoscopy that are technically not really advanced, but still precancerous. And I remove those all day long. Um, spent all morning actually doing that today. And those wouldn't be detected on a colocard. And so I miss an opportunity with colocard to prevent cancer as effectively as I can with a colonoscopy. So I think it has its place. It's useful for somebody who's refusing a colonoscopy or just really can't have one, um, but I wouldn't use it as a replacement for a colonoscopy in somebody who could. And I guess one reason people tend to shy away from the idea of a colonoscopy is the prep, which not yeah. the most enjoyable experience. Um, right. I mean, at least historically, but, you know, most people know that prepping for a colonoscopy, not so fun. Um, how important, though, is it that one does a full, like, prep for a colonoscopy? So, historically, the prep for a colonoscopy um, has been awful. And I, I, it's remarkable to me because when you think about technology and how far we've come in the world and we, like, can, like, send videos from Mars in you know, a matter of minutes, uh, hundreds and millions of miles away, but we can't seem to get a laxative right. And it's, it's, it's a phenomenon that I think um, I, I still marvel at. But the preps used to be awful. And, and unfortunately, this notion of a colonoscopy prep being terrible has kind of stuck over the years. And, and the truth is, it's really not so terrible anymore. I, I can't say that it's, you know, some people don't mind it, um, but most people don't find it as awful as they expected it to be. We've now come, we, we now have better options for colonoscopy preps as opposed to the gallon of seawater that people used to have to drink, um, yeah. and we've, we've whittled it down to two very small, typically the way I do it, is two very small bottles of a laxative, about 10 ounces each, just like little, little uh, swigs of laxative, um, and followed by, you know, many glasses of water, a lot of hydration. But the actual stuff that you have to drink is in small volume. And I have tricks that I'll give my patients to drink it cold or drink it with a straw or kind of alternate like sucking on a lemon or do things just to get the to get the taste out of their mouth if it bothers them. Um, and it turned out to be not so bad. I feel like people people go out of their way. They'll go to colon cleansing spas in Soho and spend hundreds of dollars to clean out their colons in a way that isn't nearly as effective as these two little bottles are. And um, once it's over, it is generally a very good feeling. So if you sort of just like take a deep breath in and realize that it's so important to do this right and to have a clean colon, because how well we can see doing a colonoscopy is entirely based on how clean the colon is. Um, it's not too bad. I think it's gotten a bad rap over the years. I'm hoping that over the next many years, and as people start to realize it's improved, that part will be less of a deterrent uh, for people who are contemplating but hesitant about a colonoscopy. Yeah. It, you know, you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> Outside of everything else. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. You hold your nose and yeah. you just suck it down. Yeah, even cold or through a straw, not not so easy to swallow. Exactly. But you got to do it. Not so easy. No, it really. It's true. It's true. 
<laughs> but, we but, even have a tasteless one, Carly. I do. I really? even have a tasteless prep. I do. Yeah, we use Miralax just in large volume. It has zero taste. Um, it You can mix it with, with anything you want. So it can be mixed with water or with anything that... It, it, it's not going to change the taste of whatever it's dissolved in. Um, so it is a gallon. It's 64 ounces when you use Miralax. But it's... Um, but it, uh, Sometimes it, you know, I just have to, I have to tweak it a little. It depends on the patient, but that exists in the world for people who really, really need something that they don't taste. Note to self: Miralax in the future. Note to self. <laughs> <laughs> Take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeart Radio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to gastroenterologist Dr. Jennifer Bonar. And after the break, we're going to talk about the gut microbiome, SIBO. Why pregnant women have hemorrhoids and what to do? Lots to come. Don't go away. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to gastroenterologist Dr. Jennifer Bonar. And we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call, 866-451-1451. So I think if you, you know, there's a lot of talk about this notion of the gut microbiome. What is that and why does it matter? That is one of my favorite subjects. Um, the gut microbiome is a, it's a and, that, and that's also like a, a really big question because we are just starting to scratch the surface. I think in our understanding now of um, of what the microbiome really is, I feel like it's I feel like we're starting to discover what's at the bottom of the ocean that no one ever knew because we couldn't really figure it out and get there. Um, but what the microbiome is is trillions like trillions and trillions of microorganisms that are of like um, thousands of different species um, that live inside of us. So they're bacteria and everybody's familiar with bacteria because they talk about probiotics, but they're also fungi and parasites and viruses. And for the most part, these species, um, they live inside of us very peacefully and coexist, and they probably play a very large role in modulating all sorts of aspects of our digestion and um, our immune system. Um, they're mostly found in our intestines, which is why it's something that interests me in our small and our large intestine, but you'll find them everywhere. And um, some people have even referred to the microbiome 
as a supporting organ in our body because it has so many important roles in just the day-to-day operations of, of how we work. So it's, uh, it's fascinating and it's totally invisible to the naked eye and even to really good microscopes. You need like incredibly good microscopes to see this stuff. Now, should, you know, you mentioned probiotics. Do probiotics help support the microbiome? Sometimes they do. You know, there's there's a, there's been a lot of discussion. I think I even saw a 60 Minutes um, episode a couple of months ago about, like, the mix, uh, you know, of probiotics. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, marketing out there now and I think that you know, everybody sort of has this feeling that they need to be on a probiotic as soon as you don't feel well people immediately go and grab a probiotic I don't think it hurts I don't know that it's that it's necessary I, I feel like there are times where probiotics can be very helpful and I do prescribe them for patients not that infrequently depending on what the circumstances are certainly if people have been on antibiotics I think it's not a bad idea in certain types of infections, something called C. difficile, I will usually use a probiotic. Um, for patients, whether I understand exactly why or not, uh, they feel so much better on a probiotic. It's just a supplement, usually of bacteria. Just a few, uh, you know, the strains that we've identified seem to be helpful in terms of digestive health, and it's just a it's a supplement of what we already have. It's adding just a little bit more to the mix. Um, when there's a concern that maybe things are a little off kilter. So they can be helpful. I don't discount them in terms of, you know, the benefit that they might provide for patients. I don't know that everybody needs to be on a probiotic, though. Um, I think, I mean, we can, maybe we can get to this, but I think that the better way to really populate your intestine with good bacteria um, is to eat well because your body will use the food that you eat to create this bacteria. It creates the, it, it allows this bacteria to grow. And so, um, you know, if you eat, if you eat a diet that, you know, we talk about prebiotics and prebiotics really are just these plant fibers and the things that we eat that help the bacteria in our gut to grow. So it, it allows things to just keep moving. It's the fuel that keeps it going. So, I mean, I think, they're both good, but in my opinion, if you eat more healthily, if you make an effort to eat a diet that's varied, that's you know rich in, in fiber and high in fruits and vegetables, uh, I think that you'll be able to give your your microbiome, your gut flora, um, what it needs to, to manage on its own without having to supplement as much. So the ads the facebook ads for example that suggest that if you take probiotics you will either prevent weight gain or of you know actually cause weight loss that those are sounds like those are likely untrue those are those are very interesting they're trying to get somewhere there um there was a study that i remember reading about years ago, or maybe I, maybe it came up at a conference somewhere, but I remember this study and they took mice and, you know, they're, they're trying to isolate strains of bacteria and trying to understand the, the, you know, sort of the mechanism by which they affect, you know, which bacteria can affect which elements of our overall health, whether it's autoimmune conditions, whether it's predispositions towards cancer, whether it's weight um, and they did a study, and they looked. They took mice, identical mice, and they fed one group of one mouse or one group of mice, um, you know, certain amounts of feed, and didn't give them uh, a certain strain of bacteria. And then they gave another group of mice um, the same amounts of feed and did give them a certain strain of bacteria. And right? they somehow or another they 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 altered the microbiome of these mice deliberately using a very specific strain of bacteria that they had recognized and that they suggested might have something to do with weight. And, um, and they left them identically in environments with everything else being equal. And one, strain, one group of those mice um, became morbidly obese and the other did not. And it was very interesting because nothing else was different. And so I don't think that it's completely out of the range of 
reason. And I think that we've understood that there probably is some microbiological influence on weight. The problem is that we haven't defined it well enough to be able to say this particular probiotic is the one that's going to do the trick that's going to help you lose weight, or this particular bacteria, if we eradicate it, is going to help shift your, meta- your metabolism in a more favorable way. Um, I think we might get there. I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I actually believe that we really will. I just don't think we're there yet. If we were, I would be very interested to know which bacteria that was, and um, I, I would be all over that. But it, it's, not a, it's not something that I think that we can take on face value right now when you see those ads. I think it's just excitement um, and probably some degree of marketing and stuff that we see everywhere. Yeah, marketing, I mean, Facebook. <laughs> just marketing. Just marketing. It's probably listening to you knows what you, you probably hear, heard you say, I'm not going to have that extra ice cream, like, probably. you know, scoop. And all of a sudden something pops up on Facebook that said, take this probiotic and you can. I don't think that's true. Um, now, shifting gears to some degree, women pregnancy, right? I mean, I think it's fair to say Hemorrhoids are a pretty common uh, experience in pregnancy and postpartum, and they're not too comfortable. Um, But is there a point in which they are a problem that should be evaluated or kind of just assume they're going to improve and, you know, wait it out? So hemorrhoids are very, very common. Um, They are certainly more common in pregnancy, and we can talk a little bit about why that is. But I see hemorrhoids in in people who are not pregnant, who have never been pregnant, in men. And um, they are, I tell patients when they come in, um, it's probably one of the simplest things that I treat on the list of medical conditions that I treat, yet it can be one of the most dangerous things that I treat. And the reason that it can be one of the most dangerous things that I treat is not because of the hemorrhoid itself, because the hemorrhoid itself is really nothing more than a varicose vein at the end of your tush, like in, at the end of your rectum, at the, at the opening uh, of the anal verge. Everybody has these veins. We all have them. Um, in some people, they just get a little engorged. They get swollen. They can bulge out. And it's painful. On the outside, it's painful. On the inside, it's not. Um, and they will swell, and then eventually they'll regress. Sometimes they'll bleed. Sometimes they'll bleed a lot. They can bleed in a way that's even alarming sometimes. But uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, we've never lost anyone to a hemorrhoid. The reason why it can be one of the most dangerous things that I treat is because of the, um, the, 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 the misinterpretation of symptoms. So I will have patients who will come and say, oh, I actually had a patient, a young patient, as a matter of fact, that I remember who came in. She had been in grad school and to, she was studying teaching and she had finally gotten a job as a teacher. And in grad school, when they're teaching, they like work through the school year. They work, they're at school and they work through the summers and it's just these really long, these really long years. And she came to me and finally said, I've got my first I'm finally off for like a period of time. I've had rectal bleeding for the past several years. It's my hemorrhoid. They've been bothering me for years. And I'm finally at a point where I can just come and get them treated. And I came to see you. And she's a young woman. I said, okay, so it's your hemorrhoid. I said, but you know what? Like whenever you have rectal bleeding, you have to be a hundred percent sure that the presumed hemorrhoids that are the cause of this rectal bleeding are actually there. Um, even though it seems like it, is the most likely explanation. Sometimes it isn't. And lo and behold, I went ahead and I did a, a, a quick exam. I did a sigmoidoscopy, which is a very abbreviated colonoscopy, um, which was appropriate for a young woman with fresh red blood. And she had an enormous rectal polyp, like just gigantic. I, it was really impressive. And that was actually the cause of her bleeding, and it wasn't a hemorrhoid. So this, this, there's this misconception that fresh red blood coming out from, you know, from below is a hemorrhoid. And um, so you have to always make sure that you're treating the right thing uh, when you have rectal bleeding, that you're, that you're sure that, in fact, it is a hemorrhoid. And if it is, we have lots of, lots of really, you, you know, very effective ways of treating hemorrhoids quickly and effectively and sometimes for the long run. And as I read in something recently, just don't sit in on the toilet for very long with your phone and you can reduce the risk. (laughs) 
Um, Correct. That is true. Yeah, well, we have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and when we return, we're going to speak more about dietary choices, also what SIBO is, bloating, stomach pain, lots to come. Don't go away. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the veteran's folk-style wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Dr. Jennifer Bonar. And if you want, there's still time to give us a call, 866-451-1451. So I think the concept of SIBO has mm-hmm. traded people's, not everybody, but there's more talk about it, I think, in the health and wellness world than there ever was in the past. What exactly is SIBO? So SIBO is an acronym. It stands for Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth. And that's what it is. It's basically an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. It's an abnormal increase in the, um, uh, in the overall bacterial population, particularly, though, in the types of bacteria that are not commonly found uh, in the small intestine. Um, so it can happen for all sorts of reasons. People often ask, me, why, did, like, why do I have this? Um, definitely patients with head surgery, any kind of like uh, diversions of their small bowel, um, you know, they're, they're more predisposed. Um, but anything that might slow the passage of food through the bowel, waste products through the digestive tract, so like stool, like you're overwhelmingly constipated. Uh, if there's a sluggish motility through the bowel, um, it creates this, um, like this breeding ground for bacteria, basically. And the bacteria overgrows, and um, it can cause all sorts of symptoms. And um, and patients will that it's not dangerous. It's not an infection. It's not dangerous in that it's like a, it's not a urinary tract infection or a sinus infection or a pneumonia that if you recognize that it's there, there's, you know, there's an immediate need to treat with antibiotics. Um, but it is, it is an overgrowth. So it, it, it definitely does justify antibiotic therapy if it's appropriate in a patient who's symptomatic. And... In terms of, like, for people who, for example, have bloating or stomach pain or what have you, should they inquire about whether they, you know, being tested for SIBO or are there more common reasons for bloating and stomach pain that should be evaluated first? Sometimes. 
So bloating is a very common symptom. I don't think a day goes by in my office that I won't see a full a, a full day of patients where I won't see at least a few people um, who come in complaining, at, at least in part, of bloating as a symptom that they're struggling with. Um, you know, I don't I don't do a SIBO breath test for every single person uh, who comes in with an initial complaint of bloating. It really depends on the clinical picture. So, um, you know, bloating can be uh, one of the first things I'll ask somebody who's bloated is, how do you move your bowels? Are you constipated? And often they'll say they are. And if they're constipated and they're going to the bathroom, you know, you know, two, three times a week at most, the first thing I'd rather do is try to improve their constipation and correct their constipation and then see what's left of their bloating. Most of the time the bloating um, improves and there's no reason to look further. Um, I'll ask them about their diet. I'll ask them about food that they eat. I'll ask them if they drink a lot of carbonated beverages, if they're sparkling water fanatics or if they just got one of those soda streams or if they chew gum all day and they're swallowing air. Um, it's it's a sort of take a more complete history of just everything that goes into um, that person's day and their diet and their lifestyle and, and see what makes sense. Often we will end up, especially if we are still sitting and scratching our heads after we've corrected anything that seemed obvious to correct or tried dietary modifications that didn't work, um, or in a patient who may have a history that really predisposes to SIBO, like they've had abdominal surgery or they've been on long-term antibiotics for Lyme disease or they've been on antibiotics for their skin. I find a lot of young women on antibiotics for acne and they end up taking doxycycline or minocycline for years. And um, and so I, I might come to the question mark of SIBO a little bit sooner in those patients. Now, kind of case by case basis. constipation is definitely something that is, seems pretty common. Um, pretty uncomfortable depending on the severity what how do you typically recommend people address it I mean beyond kind of the obvious you know eat more fiber right like eat right. Leafy greens. right. Um, greens good um, is that the first approach or is there medicine or like what's the way to deal with it so constipation, I, I, as you said, I mean, it's extremely common. We see this very often. I don't know if it's a, you know, I don't know if it's just a function of our diet and lifestyle or, or you know, other factors at play. But um, so constipation, when, it, when a person comes in and their, their, their main complaint is just constipation, I think the interesting thing that what makes it a little bit more able to understand is just to go through with the patient really quickly, just what are the reasons why you can be constipated? Like, how does that happen? So there are really, I think, probably three primary ways, apart from some physical obstruction to the passage of stool, like a colon cancer or something that's physically blocking the passage of stool. If you take that out of the equation for the average person, um, although it's always a concern depending on the story, um, there are three major ways why a person can be constipated. One is that they're just not taking in enough enough building blocks to create a good, healthy bowel movement. So they don't have enough fiber in their diet. They're not drinking enough water. They're not creating a situation where their body can really produce a normal, healthy stool with any degree of, you know, comfortable frequency. So for most patients, especially for my, you know, my, my female patients, my young female patients, I'll say the goal is about 25 grams of fiber a day. People might be eating salad for lunch and they still not, might not actually have 25 grams of fiber in their diet. So the simple thing to do is I'll just have them first make a list for themselves of an average day of what they might eat, pull up a list online of fiber content of foods, cross-reference the list with their list, and just tally up how much they're actually getting, and then make sure they're actually anywhere near 25 grams of fiber. If they're not, we'll supplement that just a little bit. I think that's the healthier way to start is fiber enough water, six to eight glasses of water a day, and exercise three, four days a week if they can. It doesn't have to be a gym membership, but some sort of physical activity that gets their heart rate up. Very often that's enough. And every so often I might actually throw in a probiotic just for good measure, just to see if it might help depending on how constipated they are. Um, so if you don't have the building blocks, you can't really have a normal bowel movement. The second way that you can be constipated is if there's a sluggish motility through your bowel. 
it's unusual for most people, um, but it's not un- it's not unheard of. It's absolutely possible. It's more of a colonic motility disorder where the colon's just not moving. Um, there are ways of measuring that. Very simple, simple ways of measuring that. A simple X-ray, uh, six marker study. Swallow a little capsule. You do an X-ray in five days. You see where it is, and you get a sense as to how long it took for the capsule to go how far. Um, so we might do that to see are we dealing with an issue of motility or, or not. Uh, most of the time that comes back normal every so often. It comes back abnormal, and that's a different situation we have to deal with. Um, one of the more common reasons that I see constipation that is probably one of the more commonly overlooked reasons for constipation is an outlet obstruction, meaning that the pelvic floor muscles, especially in women, but even in men, are not relaxing. So the stool, you're eating enough food, the stool is getting to the end of the colon, to the rectum, and then the pelvic floor muscles are just not relaxing when they're supposed to. There's like a, there's a miscommunication. There's a, there's a, um, a, a dysinertia where like rather than relaxing those pelvic muscles, they tighten. And so there's just no urge to go to the bathroom or people feel like they need to strain or they get a squatty potty and they try to lift their legs or they start leaning in different directions and days can go by and they have these small, very incomplete bowel movements. Um, in that situation, you can give fiber, you can give Miralax, you can give um, all sorts of, you know, stool softeners and, and laxatives, which I, I do try to avoid, honestly, I'm not in favor of stimulate laxatives with any degree of frequency, and none of it's going to help in any meaningful way because the real way to treat constipation, if that's the reason for constipation, is to address the pelvic floor musculature and, you know, you know, reset it and do it. There's physical therapy that actually does beautifully in fixing that if that's the problem. So how we treat constipation largely sort of hinges on why the person's constipated and going through that like quick, you know, exercise of trying to figure out where the issue is. Um, and, uh, and there's probably, you know, there's more to it, but there's, I think that's like sort of the general framework for how I approach constipation. Um, but yeah, fiber. And then if it's not just within the realm of those three things, just the things that I will often have patients try that are simple over the counter before we go to anything prescription, um, would be things like Miralax, um, Colace, which is a stool software we often use during pregnancy and just in general. Um, and I try to keep it as simple as possible. I try to use as little medication as I can, uh, just in general, in my practice. And if, is it safe for someone to take, you know, like a fiber equivalent or like Metamucil every day, or is that a mistake? No, that's, it's fine. It, it really is. I mean, it's just like taking a little spoonful of the fiber that you would get in anything you might otherwise eat. It really is very safe. Um, in some patients, I actually urge them uh, to do that. Patients with diverticulosis, with little pockets in the colon, um, I, I really want to keep their bowels moving. I want to keep their bowel, you know, their bowel movements um, complete and effective. And so I actually encourage those patients, if they're not getting enough fiber in their diet on a regular basis, um, which you'd be surprised that most people really aren't, um, a capful or a tablespoon of Metamucil or Benefiber um, would be be fine and safe and not have it forming in any way. Now, what about Miralax? Because I, I, now I I'm asking this question with a um, not a smirk, just a question. Like Miralax is not absorbed, correct? So I mean, there's been a lot mm-hmm. of concern by some parents that it's dangerous for children. Um, is there any validity to that? It's not dangerous. I mean, a, a Miralax is not harmful. Miralax is sort of a dulled down version of a colonoscopy prep, really just dehydrated into powder form. Um, it's just a, essentially a salt uh, solution. It's a salt that becomes dissolved in whatever it is that you put it in to drink, and it does not get absorbed out of your intestine. So it's what we call an osmotic laxative. So that what Miralax does is it doesn't stimulate the bowel to contract it. The, the kinds of laxatives that people um, are concerned about, and I think sort of the, 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 the confusion becomes that you know, you don't want to take things that are stimulant laxatives. You don't want to take Dulcolax on a regular basis. You don't want to take Senna or Cascara or Aloe on any kind of a regular basis and find that you're relying on something that forces your bowel to move to have a bowel movement. Those are laxatives. Those are the more classic laxatives that we think of, um, and those are stimulants. 
Miralax is an osmotic laxative. So technically it is a laxative because it is softening stool and making it easier to go to the bathroom. But the way that it's doing it is different. It's drawing water into the colon. Um, so it's reversing the dehydrating, the, the dehydration process um, of the bowel and it's bringing the water back in and that's all that it's doing and it's actually very safe um, it can be titrated up or down to whatever works um, for a patient to keep a little bit less or a little bit more you can't really hurt yourself with Miralax so it's not harmful it's not dangerous would I want my child to be on Miralax in perpetuity probably not um, but only because I wouldn't want my child to be on anything in perpetuity. I'd rather come up with a more healthy, natural way of helping ease their constipation, like prune juice or pear juice or something else. But is it safe? Absolutely it is. And for children that really struggle and that are really constipated, and it can be so hard for little kids sometimes with constipation, I think it's perfectly fine and safe, and I wouldn't hesitate. Uh, excellent. Well, we have to take another brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms and BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to Dr. Jennifer Bonner. And after the break, we're going to talk about gluten and other dietary restrictions. Don't go away. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern. Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. MJ Domit is the owner of Expect to be Empowered, a company whose specialty is empowering people to live their best life by following their heart and accepting themselves unconditionally. After studying and making personal changes, MJ now focuses on giving others tools for self-empowerment. She provides individual and group workshops for people who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually blocked. Inspired by her work at Expect to be Empowered, MJ authored the book Waves of Blue Light, Heal the Heart and Free the Soul with a company empowerment cards she is a spirit book of the year gold medal living now book award winner and her book is a number one amazon bestseller in spirituality and was a 2012 gold medal winner recognized as the living now spirit book of the year an inspirational speaker mj will show you how you can repurpose every area of your life your life did not just happen to you you chose it which means you can change it visit www.expecttobeempowered.com or call 866-264-8024 Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to gastroenterologist Dr. Jennifer Bonner. And I want to make sure we get in today because it's, you know, diet, which we touched on a moment ago, you know, in the last segment. But a lot of people are um, under the impression that gluten is bad, um, that it's bad for gut health, it's bad for our bodies, etc. Is that true? No, I don't think gluten is bad. Uh, gluten can be very bad for the for a person who shouldn't be eating gluten, but not everybody who's walking around shouldn't be eating gluten. Um, I very, very, very much believe in, um, I focus a lot on diet in my practice. I think that a lot of, just in general, what we, um, you know, illnesses that we, you know, that, that we experience and that, that we develop and, and symptoms that we experience are often very much hinged on how we eat and what we eat. But gluten is this, gluten has been targeted as this category of food that's just bad. Um, and I don't know if that's the case. Gluten is very bad, like very, very bad for somebody who has celiac. Um, a person who has celiac, true celiac, not celiac that I think I have celiac because when I eat a piece of bread, I get bloated. But actual celiac disease that's been diagnosed properly, that person should not eat gluten. Uh, gluten will actually um, 
uh, damage their small bowel, right? very much so. Um, what happens is when, when, they, when a person who really should not be eating gluten eats gluten, and that is a person who has celiac, and celiac is actually an autoimmune condition. Um, it's a genetically predisposed condition. Um, happens to be much more common than we realize. Um, you know, it, it's estimated that one in a hundred people around the world actually has celiac. It is an overwhelmingly underdiagnosed condition. So I, I give that to this realm of should I or should I not be eating gluten and do I have celiac? The question is, do you actually have celiac? And I think that um, you know, patients should be tested properly. But if you do have celiac and you eat gluten, then what happens is your body mounts an immune response to the ingestion of gluten, and your immune system actually attacks the small bowel. It actually does that, and we can I can see it with my eyes in the after effects of what happens in a person who's eaten gluten and didn't know they shouldn't. And so what happens is it damages the those little like uh, finger like projections, the little villi, the little hair like projections of the small bowel, um, it, it flattens them. Um, and by doing that, it really significantly impairs your intestines' ability to absorb nutrients and um, malabsorption take, you know, sort of kicks in. And so many, and by malabsorbing, consequently, there are um, nutritional deficiencies and risks for all sorts of other things, actually, including osteoporosis and iron deficiency anemia. And interestingly, especially I think in some of the work that you do, Carly, patients who have celiac who don't know that they have celiac and eat gluten are also at risk for infertility, very much so. And I've actually seen that, unfortunately, in patients who will present to me with a history of just multiple miscarriages and nothing else and nothing else to, to, you know, that, that might make them think that they had celiac. And I'll send off a celiac panel, and it, it has happened that I've discovered uh -huh. celiac in a person who never really had GI symptoms but just had a history. They had symptoms of something else that they might have come to me for. Maybe they came to me with an iron deficiency anemia, but it's part of their history that really caught my attention was repeated miscarriages. So a person who should not be eating, and I know that's something that you, that you, that you do that, that's within the realm of your practice, um, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate and it's very significant, but in a person who shouldn't be eating gluten, which is really just a person who has celiac disease, um, it's very dangerous. It's actually very bad. And also, there's even risk of malignancy in the small bowel if you eat gluten and you have celiac. So the real question is, do you or don't you have celiac? The general population entering into this realm of, I'm not going to eat gluten, it's fine. I mean, you don't have to eat gluten. I tend to feel better if I don't eat tremendous bowls of pasta on a regular basis, an entire challah roll, like all at once. Like I'm probably better off not eating that. It's probably healthier not to eat a lot of empty carbs in general and to vary, you know, the carbs with maybe healthier grains. But the better thing to do before somebody just goes strictly gluten free is if if they suspect that they have symptoms that might suggest celiac or that might suggest a gluten intolerance bloating, um, abdominal discomfort, irregular bowel habits, interestingly, um, skin rashes, even sometimes like a really refractory eczema, I've seen that, um, and that's it's actually a manifestation of celiac. Um, a funny thing that patients will also sometimes tell me is just brain fog. They just feel foggy. Their stomach doesn't hurt. Their bowels are so-so. Like there's nothing crazy, but they just have this crazy brain fog and they can't seem to clear their head. They can't seem to focus. Um, the better thing to do is first actually go and get tested for celiac and see if you do or don't have celiac before you go gluten-free. Um, and that's a problem because I have patients that will come to me already gluten-free for months and months and then say, I, I want to know if I have celiac. And I can't test if they have celiac anymore once they're gluten-free. Not reliably. I can't prove that they have it. I might be able to prove that they don't but by you know, with a genetic test, but I can't prove that a person who is actually gluten-free for an extended period of time um, has celiac anymore because technically that's the treatment. It will correct. So that's, that's the beauty of celiac is that if you go gluten-free, um, it becomes, uh, it resolves, it clears. Autoimmune, the, the predisposition exists, but the actual damage to the body, that the, the, the things that one might be able to pick up on on blood work or, or on biopsy are totally normalized. 
so I can't tell at that point if something is normal, if it's normal because a person, person's actually gluten-free and they should have been, or if it's normal because they never had celiac to begin with. So gluten is not bad. Um, gluten can be bad for a person who shouldn't be eating gluten. Gluten is not necessarily like advised as like a major food group that should be eaten, but it's not, it's not restricted unless there's a real reason to restrict it, I think, whether it's you know, genetically predisposed or just symptomatically people don't feel as well um, eating it. So that's a really long answer to is gluten bad, isn't it? <laughs> it's a good answer, but unfortunately we've run out of time, but your website is awesome. So can you tell our listeners what it is? Sure. It's uh, www.bonheurmd, B-O-N-H-E-U-R, that's my name, md.com. Excellent. And if you're in the New York area, this is the doctor to see. And if you're not, just check out her website because it's pretty awesome. Well, thank you so thank you, much. Carly. This was so it informative. Was a pleasure. Uh, thank you. And thank you to our listeners. Remember, if you missed any of this show, you can always download it as a podcast on iTunes along with prior episodes. Tune in again every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern on iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, or BoldBraveMedia.com slash shows slash MD hyphen for hyphen moms. And I look forward to hearing from you. You can always email me with questions, concerns, or thoughts at cs at carlysnydermd.com. Also, you can check out my website, which has a lot of blog posts about women's mental health and wellness. That's at carlysnydermd.com. And you'll find next week's episode's information on the website. So this has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and until next time, be well, eat well, stay safe. Please continue to wear a mask and practice social distancing. Um, Even if you've gotten vaccinated, please, please, for the good of all of us for the moment, stay safe by wearing a mask. And, of course, as always, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company